part 6 of the engine rebuild and this part is going to be about bolting the heads back on the engine. So I'll start off by showing you guys how to assemble one of these heads, so putting the springs and the valves back, on, back in the head and then actually bolting these heads back on the engine and after that I'm also going to be showing you guys how to get the timing right on one of these engines and I'll also show you a quick test that you guys can do even on your cars to test whether your timing is at the right point and that can also tell you whether you have too much timing chain slack. So you might remember these heads from part 2 when I ported and polished the intake ports and also the um, exhaust ports. So in that part I showed you how to disassemble these heads and how to port and polish them but for this part I'm going to be showing you how to um, reinstall everything back on the head and then um, bolt it back on the engine. So starting off by some of the things that I did on the head before actually um, putting all the valves and everything back in. So I first cleaned the intake and the exhaust valves just to get rid of any carbon buildup that was on the valves. I just used WD-40 and a scotch Brite pad to clean the valves. Don't be too aggressive on them because there is a coating. I think the exhaust valves are ceramic coated and the intake valves also have some coating on them. After that I measured the thickness of the valve stems just to make sure that they weren't worn by any significant amount. Then I also measured the clearances between the camshaft and the bearing bridge using plastic gauge. So the clearances for the camshaft were between 0.38 and 0.51 of a millimeter, so they were also looking really good. After that I also tested how good the valves were sitting against the valve seat, so I put some grease on the valve seats. Usually you're supposed to use paint, but I didn't have paint, so I just used some grease and I put that around the valve seats and then I pushed the valve down and the valve leaves a mark in the grease and then you can tell how well the valve is actually touching against the valve seat. The mark should be even all across and it should have a certain thickness which means that the valve is making proper contact with the valve seat. Um, if the valve is only touching the valve seat on, on one part that means that the valve might be bent or something might be deformed. And once all that was done it was finally time to put the valves and everything back on the heads. So I started off by putting those metal things back in that go below the valve spring. After that it was time to put the valves back in, just make sure to put some oil on the valve stems when you're putting them back in. Once the valves were in place, next I had to install the valve stem seals. So for installing these seals, they come with these two plastic guides. You're supposed to put the plastic guides on the valves first and then you're supposed to uh, slide the seals onto them just to make sure that the seal doesn't get damaged when you're installing it. And once the seal is installed, you can simply remove that um, plastic part. After that it was time to put the springs back on and then the spring retainers that go on top of the springs. And then after this I just used my cheap valve spring compressor to compress the spring. This was a spring compressor I bought off Amazon for $20. It actually bent before it could compress the spring so I had to add that extra metal support on it. But after adding that it worked pretty well. Once the spring is compressed just use a magnet to install the valve keepers. These are two clips that go on either side of the valve stem. And they are what prevents the um, valve retainer from flying off the valve. And once these are installed just uncompress the spring. The spring tension is what holds these valve keepers in place. Also talking a bit about this three valve design that came on these engines, this was actually something pretty weird because it only came in these engines. The generation of engines before this had four valves and the generation of engines after this had four valves. This was the only generation of engines that had three valves and two spark plugs. I guess the main reason for this change was fuel efficiency. They wanted to increase their fuel efficiency in their V8 engines. Uh, so what two spark plugs helped them do was like um, the um, ignite the combustion chamber at two different points so the whole air fuel mixture can burn a little faster which helps them improve the efficiency of the engine but in terms of flow I don't think these heads flow as well as the four valve design in fact even the engines the M113's that initially replaced the M119's the four valve engines they actually had less horsepower output than the older engines the other thing about these heads was it was actually a pretty simple design for the time because if you think about like 1997 that's when all other manufacturers were going with variable valve timing or VTEC or VNOS or some way of controlling valve timing to um, improve the performance of the engine but when you think of these engines they just had a single overhead cam and a fixed camshaft too so there was no variable valve timing or anything on these heads so it was an extremely simple design for the time especially from an AMG engine and I think that's a really good thing because that's probably the reason why there's nothing that goes wrong on these heads because if you think of the um, engines that came after this one the M156 those engines did have a lot of issues with the camshafts and some of the newer engines they also had issues with the variable valve timing systems so the magnets needed to be replaced every after every like um, certain interval because it used to go bad um, whereas in these heads there's not even that much that can go wrong the only problems I've heard of happening is just with hydraulic lifters and simple things like that that's probably why these heads don't really run into any issues because it's a really simple design to begin with Another thing I have to tell you about these heads is do not machine them if you see a bit of warp on them because it's pretty common to see warp on aluminum heads whenever you unbolt them from the engine so there would be a bit of warp when you uh, measure the warp like longitudinally and maybe even transverse. Uh, the warp I saw on these heads was about 0.2 or 0.02 or 0.03 of a millimeter like just um, measuring the warp longitudinally 
um, there was about like 0.2 or 0.3 of a millimeter gap over here, which is not too much. And there's actually a document that specifically tells you not to machine these heads if there's warp longitudinally or warp transversely, because because when you actually bolt these heads to the engine, the torque of the head bolts actually like takes away that warp. So it like holds these heads against the engine so firmly that it eliminates like any warp that the heads would have anyways. The only time the document tells you when you should be machining the heads is when there's mechanical damage. And the only other cases I can think of when you actually need to machine these heads is when there's corrosion. So like let's say you have a leaking head gasket and it causes corrosion between um, these points or maybe a coolant line and the um, combustion chamber. That's the only time you actually need to machine the surface and to get it um, flat again and maybe even if these heads are warped by an extreme amount and there's also a maximum limit to how much you can machine these heads that's 0.3 of a millimeter after this it was time to put the head gasket on the block now i did put some sealant underneath the head gasket or actually both underneath the head gasket and over the head gasket uh, there is a document that tells you to apply sealant on some places but it only tells you to do it if there's um, some defect in the surface but as far as i've seen all the m113s i've seen uh, they do have sealant applied on the head gasket from the factory like that's how they come they always have sealant on them so just to be on the safe side, that's why I applied some sealant on some critical areas. After that, it was just time to put the heads back on. Just make sure that it clears the timing chain and goes on the proper alignment dials that it's supposed to be on. And after that, I just put some assembly lube on the head bolts and then inserted the head bolts in place. The sequence that you need to follow for torquing these bolts is on this page. So you need to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's the pattern you need to follow for torquing these down. Um, and I'll show you in just a second how to torque these down. Now there's also a document that tells you to check the length on these um, head bolts to check if they're uh, good for use or not. And the maximum length that these can stretch to is 144.5. I also measured mine. Mine did stretch and they were stretched to um, 142.5 millimeters. So that stretched by one millimeter over the length of a new bolt. Um, I'm replacing these bolts anyways because I don't want to take the risk reusing these. But I guess according to this document, you might be good for reusing these bolts if they're below um, this maximum length. That said, the rule I've heard mostly is that um, whenever you're using these bolts that get torqued to 90 degrees or any like angle, you're usually supposed to replace these bolts every time because these are called um, what's called uh, torque to yield bolts. So you're actually torquing them beyond their maximum strength and you're actually stretching the bolts. So what happens is if you reuse these bolts and you stretch them twice, there might be a risk that the bolt might break the second time you use it. That's why it's recommended to replace these bolts every time. But for a few of these bolts, there are documents that tell you to check the length and replace them if they're beyond that length. So I guess in that case, it means that you might be fine to reuse them if they're um, within the length. And I know a couple of you guys were asking where I get these um, documents from. Well, I downloaded the service manual from eManual online. Um, you can, if you guys know of Alex's channel, Legit Streetcars, he actually recently uploaded instructions on how to download this on uh, one of his videos. Uh, so you can head over to his channel. He also had a coupon code for that website. I'm not sure which video it was, but I'll try to link it down in the description so you guys can um, know the instructions on how to download these um, service manuals. For torquing down these head bolts, they need to be torqued down in four stages. So the first stage is 10 Newton meters. So just torque these bolts down in 10 Newton meters following the pattern given in the service manual. And then the second stage is 30 Newton meters following the same pattern. I'll actually let you watch the whole thing so you can actually see the pattern I'm following. Then for the third stage, you need to turn these bolts 90 degrees. You can use one of these torque angle gauges just to make sure you get your angle right. And then for the fourth stage, you need to do the exact same thing again, just turn the bolts another 90 degrees. To keep track of how much I'm turning the bolts, what I like to do is after the second stage, I like to mark the bolts so that when I turn them 90 degrees and then I turn them 90 degrees again, I can actually see how much I'm turning the bolt. Um, it's important to keep track of that because if you accidentally turn the bolt 90 degrees like one more time than you're actually supposed to, you can overstretch the bolt. After the 10 main head bolts are torqued down, there's these four other bolts that link the head to the timing case, or actually one of them is even going to the block, but there's these four smaller bolts and these need to be torqued down to 20 Newton meters. Next it was time to install the camshaft, so I just put some assembly lube on the camshaft and I put it in. And there's actually a groove that has to line up with the key that's in the camshaft sprocket, and it, it can only go on one way, so it's impossible to get the timing uh, wrong on this engine if you followed the steps that I explained in the previous video. The copper part of the chain in lining up with the marks. Because if you followed that, there's only one way the timing chain sprocket can go on the camshaft, and it's pretty much impossible to screw the timing up if you get all this right. 
After that I inserted the bolts for the camshaft sprocket, also make sure to put some assembly lube on this bolt, I just hand tightened it for now but I'll show you how to torque it later. For now I got to installing the camshaft bearing bridges, just one thing to be careful of before you install these uh, bearing bridges, make sure that your engine is at the 40 degree mark, that's the same position I left it in the previous video, I haven't turned my engine over since then. The reason I guess they suggest that position is because that's the position on which none of your pistons are at top that center, so if, even if one of your valves is to open up, it's not going to hit one of your pistons and there's no risk of interference. For installing these bearing bridges, there's also a torque sequence that you have to follow. It's really important to make sure you don't bend these bearing bridges when you're torquing them down because they are machined together with the head. Your entire head would pretty much be useless if you damage one of these bearing bridges. These bolts need to be torqued down in two stages. The first stage is 8 Nm and the second stage is 120 degrees. Now different versions of the M113 did have different torque specifications for these bolts, so just be careful to follow the one for your engine. This one is for the AMG, the supercharged variants, the M113.990 or the 991. After that I got to torquing down the bolts for my camshaft sprocket. Now you need to hold the camshaft sprocket with a 27mm spanner and then you need to torque this bolt down in two stages. The first stage is 50mm and the second stage is 90 degrees. After that I got to installing my timing chain tensioner. Now on some models you need to replace the timing chain tensioner itself but on this model you don't need to replace it. All you need to do is just put it upside down and press it a few times just to get all the oil out of it. Make sure that you can compress it before you put it in. And you need to change that washer for it. It's a crush washer and you need to change that every time you unbolt this from the engine. The torque specification for this one is 80 Newton meters. After all this was done, I cut these wire ties off that I applied in the previous video just to make sure that the timing chain wouldn't move on the timing chain sprocket, but now there's no need for it since the timing chain tensioner was in place. And now I finally got to doing a few tests to make sure that my timing is right. So the first test is to turn your engine clockwise and just make sure that there is no interference so none of your valves run into your pistons or uh, everything is turning smoothly. And you actually need to turn the engine 14 rotations before you can actually get these copper things to come back on the positions that they should be at. For checking whether my timing is at the right point, what I'm going to do is there's this test that tells you all the values for when your intake and exhaust valves should be opening and closing. And using these values you can actually test, like you can actually turn your crankshaft and see if your intake and exhaust valves are actually opening at that exact point. And this will not only tell you whether you have the right timing, it will also tell you if you have any timing chain slack. Because the more slack you have in your timing chain, you will see a slight retard in that timing. So rather than your um, intake valve opening at let's say um, 25 degrees, it might be opening at 30 degrees, which will tell you that you have five degrees of timing chain slack. Another quick way of checking your timing whether it's right on this engine is that you can move the crank pulley to 40 degrees and make sure that um, these two keys that are inserted on your camshafts, um, you can see these keys over here, that they're pointing towards the inside of the weed. There's actually a tool you can get for this, uh, for checking your timing. The tool goes right over here and it fits right into that key. And if that tool fits in, that means that your timing is at the right point. So I'll take you along and show you how I do this test because it is a little confusing because you have to mark the positions for bottom dead center and top dead center. So starting off with the intake valves, like uh, what angle the intake valves open at, what I'll do is I'll slowly move the crankshaft and I'll keep looking at these intake cams. Um, so intake rockers actually, so you can see that they just moved right over here. So when the cams are not pushing on the rockers, they should have a lot of play right now. But right now you can see that they've reached the point where they're just about to open these valves. Um, but I'll just turn it a little more because I know that um, it's still not like there's still a bit of play in this. So I'll just turn it just a bit more. Um, so there's no play left in these rockers now. So that's the degree mark where my intake valves are starting to open and I'll note that position over there so that's at exactly 20 degrees right now so the value for this uh, number to the timing of the inlet valves opening is 20 degrees for my engine um, I'll note that down and next I have to measure when these valves actually close uh, now the closing of these valves is when like right now they're gonna open and after that they're gonna start to close so right now they're closing now they're completely closed and now there's play in the um, rockers again uh, but now you can see that there's actually no degree markers on this side, there, there's only degree markers on that side. So what I'll actually do is that I'll take the values from cylinder 4 rather than cylinder 1, because cylinder 4 is at 180 degrees phase from this one. So when this is at top dead center, this one is at bottom dead center. So the degree marker that says top dead center for 1 um, actually means bottom dead center for cylinder 4. Um, so this value that says closes after bottom dead center, I will take I will just look at the intake valves so you can see that the intake valves are open right now and then I'll actually see when they start to close so I'll keep turning the engine and 
keep looking at the uh, so there now they're closed completely now you can just see there's a bit of play building up so I'm gonna stop right here because right now I know that these two valves are closed all the way and now I actually have a degree marking over here so it is it's actually right at about 35 maybe slightly 36 degrees um, and that means it's 35 degrees after bottom dead center because um, this piston was at bottom dead center when this piston was at top dead center so that means um, bottom dead center for number four and number four is at the position 36 degrees after bottom dead center so I'll note that number for the closing of the intake valves so now I know when my intake valves were opening and not when my intake valves were closing. Next I have to measure the um, values for the exhaust valves. So here's the final numbers I got after doing the test. So th these are the numbers for bank 1 and these are the numbers for bank 2. And just to show you some of the numbers, so my intake valves should have been opening at 25.7 degrees, whereas they were actually opening at 20 degrees, so it's slightly more advanced than what the test says. But for other values, it's actually pretty close. So like, the exhaust valves should be closing at 11.3 degrees, whereas they were actually closing at 12 degrees and 10 degrees. Now a slight bit of inaccuracy can also be um, caused because like the degree markers on this crankshaft are actually not that accurate, so they're in increments of 5 so you're definitely not going to be able to see uh, a number as accurate as 11.3 on something like that and it's also because of like when you're actually doing the test and like seeing uh, when the exhaust valve starts to open it is actually a bit of a difficult thing to do so it might cause like a slight bit of inaccuracy of one or two degrees uh, but regardless these numbers are pretty close to what I should be getting just to tell you even if the timing chain slips one tooth like even if it's one tooth off on the sprocket that will make a difference of 20 degrees um, so that's something that you'll definitely be able to see in this test because if these numbers were off by 20 degrees <laughs> that would actually be a pretty obvious difference um, so this is actually a really good way to test whether your timing is right. Now these values are because my timing chain is new but as over time the timing chain starts to get stretched and it starts to wear out uh, these values will become slightly more retarded so because the test is even for a used timing chain and the test is saying 25 whereas I'm actually getting 20 so that might be because I have a new timing chain and my timing chain hasn't stretched at all right now um, but as over time the timing chain stretches these values will start to become slightly more retarded and so this is actually a pretty good way to even test your timing chain whether your timing chain is still uh, within reasonable values because for doing this test it's actually pretty easy you can just um, take your valve covers off and then turn your crank pulley and actually then see when these um, valves start to move and you'll actually be able to tell you don't need to disassemble your whole engine for this test all you need to do is just take your valve covers off uh, so it's actually a pretty quick and easy way of testing your valve timing now that everything is good with the heads I've just flipped the engine over one final time or hopefully one final time and it's time to put the lower oil pan back on just a few things I forgot to mention in the previous video that other people pointed out. Uh, so one thing to be careful of when installing the upper oil pan is just to make sure that it's um, level with the uh, engine block so that if these things aren't matched when you're bolting the transmission on the bolts might not line up or uh, the transmission might not sit flat with the block. And also the same for the oil pump, there's no alignment dowels in the oil pump either so when you're, when you're putting this back on just make sure to turn it and make sure that it's turning freely because if all the stages of this oil pump are not aligned then it wouldn't turn or, or there might be some resistance when you're turning it. So after this I just got to installing my lower oil pan. The process is pretty similar to what I showed in the previous video for the upper oil pan. Just apply the gasket maker 2mm thickness. Uh, this time it goes on the inside of all the bolts. And after the lower oil pan was in place, next I just had to install this oil temperature and level sensor. Just make sure to change the o-ring on that. I've actually changed all the rubbers on my engine by this point, I think. Uh, so hopefully, I hope that there will be no more oil leaks from this engine. So this is as far as I'm going to get for this video. I was also planning to put the valve covers back on, but the thing is that my valve covers still look like crap right now. I have to do a lot of cleaning and um, restore these valve covers before I can actually put them on. Um, so I'll leave that for a different day, um, but regardless there's not an awful lot of work left on this engine All I have to do is put the valve covers back on um, Assemble the front of the engine so put the power steering the alternator and all those things back on and then Bolt on the supercharger and then finally I'll be at the point where I can actually test the engine I might even try to make a separate video on um, restoring these valve covers So if you guys want to see that maybe I can upload that in uh, the next few days and um then whenever I get time, I'll just get to bolting the rest of this engine back together. But yeah, that's it for this video, and thanks for watching.